Hey, welcome to Drum Talk with Earl Bennett, and today with Stephanie Bennett, my wife, uh, music journalist, um, author of novels and textbooks, and she works at a university, and she's the she's got a PhD, and she's also known as Doctor B. Yeah, yeah. Enough about me, Earl. Okay. Okay. This is Drum Talk, not Steph Talk, and we are going to talk drums today, aren't we? Yes. This is May 1988. Who wants to go back there? Hey, I'm looking at this. <laughs> I'm saying, you want that hair? Would you mm -hmm. like that hair? You never had that hair. I never had that hair. What did, did you have, have? I had a mullet, though. <laughs> you, it was very curly. I remember when I cut my mullet off, though. I do remember that, too. Okay. It was curly and beautiful. You still have beautiful hair. But, yeah, so we're going back to 1988 today. In future drum talks, we'll go to 1990. We'll go to other issues. But you wanted to talk about this issue because there's an article I did in there called Brothers in the Business. Right. By John, uh, about John and Mark Hammond. That's correct. I would love to tell the folks, just welcome them into our conversation and tell them about how we met John and Mark and how they ended up in Modern Drummer. Why don't you tell that story? Because it was all about you. Actually, most of the people that I interviewed in these magazines was because um, you met them or you thought they were great. Or they were my favorite drummer. Yes. Okay. There were what people I was influenced by. Those were the guys I wanted to, wanted oh, yeah. to see Modern Drummer actually interview. And unfortunately, um, you don't have control over that until you have somebody that's actually writing for Modern <laughs> Drummer magazine. And that's what uh, Stephanie queried Mo Modern Drummer in that year of 87. It also happened to be the same year I was going to get into a band called Saved by Grace. And I met these guys, and they needed a drummer, and they were getting ready to record an album in Nashville. And I happened to get on the train at the right time. And all of a sudden, in August of 1987, I ended up uh, on an album in Nashville in a recording studio. It was a and great I, album. Yep, it really we, was good. And we spent a week in Nashville. And the first day of recording, um, we went in there, did five songs, a couple, three with the click, a um, couple without the click. And... The last one on the day one was a ballad, and um, was it here we are? It wasn't here we are. It was another ballad. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but um, had dual dual lane highways. I can't remember the name of that song. I can't. It's just. <laughs> it's I, the cobwebs all out I remember of our was we got through that one. I got through that track, and the next morning I had to come back and play with the click track. Running that, on empty? Was it running on? No, I did. We did do running on empty that day too. Uh, we did running on empty. Did straight ahead. I mean, we did here we are, and we did here we are on day two, and that was the day that, that was here we are. So good. it was a solid rock ballad. It was just it was my favorite. Song. Yeah, it had it had some of those um, Nigel Olsen influenced trump fills by me, oh, which yeah. I I love playing ballads. But on this day, it wasn't that much fun because unfortunately it was about four hours in, and we got the track, and we're going to lunch, and Mark Baldwin, the producer, is going. Uh, we need to bring a session guy in because we're not moving fast enough on this stuff. And they called um, John Hammond in and Gary Lund to come in to play bass and drums on uh, our album. And that's when I met John Hammond. And John Hammond was the nicest guy in the world. Um, matter of fact, I think he had that K China that day too. I think there's a K China over here. He had that K 19 inch K China. I think oh it was. yeah, that's definitely. But a um, anyhow, it was an interesting session because I got to watch him work and um, on my way back I took his helped him bring his stuff out to the car his snare and his cymbals and I said you work you wrote for Modern Drummer Magazine maybe I get you an article in Modern Drummer Magazine I think he thought I was crazy at that point in time because he just replaced me and I was nice to him and then I'm telling him that I'm going to get him an interview in Modern Drummer Magazine I don't think he really believed me but that was but listen that was pretty traumatic I remember getting a call home that week and you were upbeat you were like yeah yeah everything's good. as upbeat as you can be you know, no, sorry. <laughs> that's true. I think that's true. I'm thinking her own uh, left feet. Yeah, I was pretty no, Eeyore probably at that you point. were, but uh, for you, you were like, yeah, no, this was, this is going well. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I wasn't in Nashville. I was home with three babies, right. but very happy to be. You let me know that, too. Yes, I did. <laughs> I was very happy to be just nurturing your dream and, and seeing you shine. I loved that because... I love creativity, just whether it's my husband or my students, I love to see people just step up into their creativity and you were having fun. But I said I noticed something in your voice that night when you said, um, yeah, everything's going well. I said, what's going on? And, and you had said to me you were replaced. And then just, but you were kind of like, okay about it. No, 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 it's okay. I'm, you know, I did six songs. 
And a couple nights later when you called, before you came home, you seemed much more upbeat. And I, I said to you, what's going on? How do you feel about that? Are you depressed about this? And you said, no, no, no. No, I'm, I'm really learning a lot. And you came home. And I'll never forget this. You said, Steph, it was the drum lesson of my life. I learned so much. And I thought, I, I thought to myself, I, I was so proud of you. Because I thought, you have, you have really taught me a lot in my life about stuff like when I fail and fall flat on my face or when I've failed in the past you're like keep on going take it and learn from it and this was like this is your MO always and you really did it in Nashville 25 years ago when you learned so much about the music business and about studios and, no, you're right. and, and what did you tell us about what you learned from John Hammond from that lesson of your life well what I would say about this is I, I mean Guys like John Hammond, studio guys, they were called in because they can get tracks done fast. And I was always wanted to be a studio guy, so Hal Blaine was a favorite, Jim Keltner, uh, Russ Kunkel. Hal Blaine wrote to you once, I know that. Yes, I have, that, I have actually his letter up on my wall. Maybe I'll go to that one day. That was an interesting... I never interviewed him. But um, guys like Gad, of course, and Rick Murata, and Jeff Picaro, and all those guys, they were all my, my heroes. So... To actually be replaced was traumatic, but I also realized it was my opportunity to really see what this was about. What I did learn from John Hammond was when you go in and do a session, you got to come in with that presence, you got to come in with that attitude. Yeah. And he came in and he just sat down and knew exactly what to play, gave who he was. I remember on one of the songs, um, In the Distance, he did this crazy outfill and they kept it. And it was because he put his spin and his personality yeah. on it, and he yeah. was doing. It was it was a rather cool thing. And yeah. I never ever could play the fill exactly like he played it, but I always felt like that's the kind of thing you yeah. want to bring to a studio. Yeah. And I think all the greats always have these moments mm -hmm. where they put a little bit of themselves. You yeah. know, the Gad Fifty Ways to Leave Your Lover thing, or yeah. you know, Jeff's Rosanna thing. Yeah. They, they all have those signature things they pull off, and yeah. if they don't pull them off on every record, they're always trying to find one spot where they can put some of themselves yeah. and even if it's just the way they lay the the uh, backbeat behind yeah. the click they you do. Know? well and I was always so sorry by the way I don't think I ever told you this but I was always so sorry that I never got to interview those heroes of yours um, Robin Flans was doing that yeah, Robin um, Flans got to do but those, the but. guys that I interviewed like everyone from Ron Tutt and Bill Maxwell and um, New York guys like John Riley and and the Rippingtons and so many others I learned so much from them, and I loved, I loved doing that long-form journalism. You know, I don't teach journalism now. I do teach communication, but I'm not in the journalism department. Um, I don't even teach feature writing, um, but I love it. And, and what's changed, I mean, we have a lot of new, many new outlets and, and ways to disseminate information and get stories out now. We have many right. more ways than we had back in the 80s, but one thing that we're missing and we're lacking, but for a very few magazines, there's no long-form journalism I mean, anymore. some of those feature articles from Modern Journal were like 3,000 words, weren't they? Oh, more than 3,000 words. Yeah. I was working on them for over a month. I was just going through them and just combing through and editing. I mean, and today taking... you're lucky if you get 1,500 oh, words. That is a huge article. 1,500? Right. Oh, my goodness, no. It's a different... It's a different in publishing environment today. Well, it Everything's is. Everything's soundbite driven, it's Twitter driven, it's, you know, it's very quick, It's and usually the publicist wants you to talk about the new project. Exactly. And they don't go into the, the depth of an article. And I mean, that's why I stopped subscribing to some of these drum magazines. I think the only one other than Modern Drummer I actually subscribe to is Drumhead, Drumhead. Magazine. But Earl, there's reasons for that. I mean, everything in this digital culture has changed so much. People need to monetize their work, and because of that, because no one's making right. money the old-fashioned way. Subscribe to my channel now. Oh I'm yeah, like, like <laughs> we're looking at making money from this. No, no. we're just having fun here, right. and we want to provide something for the interested public um, right. to have a little fun too, because there is always a story behind the story. Right. right there's always so much context that you can so much detail that you can put into a story that if you're interested in that topic or that artist you will really just eat it up i love reading so stuff like what's that what's the one thing you took away talking to john haven oh gosh now you're making me go back like 25 years in my head here well, i'll remember this. Done the research on this i course. didn't okay. we're just we're having fun here i remember that john was a very happy guy 
that he had more than just drumming. I and remember that too because he was going fishing after the he session. He was going fishing. That was, that was he, his thing. I'm going to go fishing He today. didn't let drumming, right. he was not enslaved to drumming. He was not enslaved to his musicianship. So I remember that he was a really well-rounded guy, which probably means he's still really happy instead of going insane like so many mu musicians. And well, he's still do. doing it. I mean, yeah. I still see John on records. I see him in Nashville. Yeah. Um, he's in a couple bands in Nashville playing in town. What's he in now? Is uh, he? Tim Aker in the smoking section with Mark Baldwin. Mark too. Baldwin! Yes. If we had moved to Nashville, we would be friends, closer friends with Mark and Mindy. Oh, yes, I love those guys. It. Oh, but, if you hear this, we love you. But um, there are some great great guys in Nashville and John's one of them you know he's one of the nicest cats yeah. you'll ever meet his brother Mark I know went on to do a lot more production work than drumming yeah. but he was a great drummer in his yeah. own right back then and matter of fact what I was told was John was the B guy and they brought Mark they wanted to get Mark but they got John they but were both I tell A you, guys John's an A guy he's they a were totally both A guys guy. they really yeah. were I just want to say I've had a good time chatting with you today I mean this is something that we do every day of our lives for right. over right 30 years it. And Drinking some coffee and having a good time talking about things. Well, it is. But um, we definitely need to wrap things up. So. So I hope you've had fun times talking drums. I hope you've had fun listening to uh, drums. And we just want to say bye for now. This has been Drum Talk with Earl and Stephanie Bennett. And we wish you a very good evening and hope that you'll come back and join us. Bye.